Marvel Cinematic Universe and DC Extended Universe. The two have been battling it out for years, and some think that DC may finally be getting a leg up on the competition. It does have some potentially big box office hits on the way, but will they be enough to give DC an equal share in the box office pie? And could the political angles of these franchises be the defining factor in that question? My name is Caleb Smith, and you're watching Sinpole. <laughs> If you don't know already, Disney and Warner Brothers have been battling at the box office for years over the superhero film market. So far, Marvel is ahead by billions of dollars, and everyone has their own opinion on why DC has been unable to keep up, and whether they will, with films like Suicide Squad and Justice League, be able to level the playing field with Marvel. Most seem to be of the opinion that DC will never measure up to Marvel at the box office, and I happen to be of the same opinion. It's an easy forecast to make because of prior trends, but the reason for why this trajectory is likely, well, everyone's got their own theory. And what I believe to be the real reason for why the franchise hasn't measured up is virtually never discussed. Which is why I want to propose the theory that the reason for which the DC Extended Universe and Suicide Squad will never measure up to Marvel at the box office is because of its political affiliation. Three things we need in order to understand this theory. First, the two series' political orientations. Second, people's political orientation and the subsequent films that they gravitate toward. And third, an answer to the skeptics of my theory. So first, what are these two series' politics? To start with, Marvel has a lot of films out right now, and I'm not going to break all of them down, and I don't think I really need to, because I think that the only exception to the Marvel films being liberal are the Thor films. All this because Loki desires a throne. It is my birthright. Your birthright was to die as a child. So I'm just going to break down Marvel by its most recent film, Captain America Civil War. Because it is Disney's most recent film, and because it is also the political antithesis of the other film which I intend to break down, Batman vs Superman. What are the two films' political messages? Well, they both deal with the same question, whether we as humans function optimally through autonomy or through external influence. Now, remember that liberals are of the opinion that humans are by nature good and need no form of external influence to keep them on the straight and narrow. This is the belief in question when the Avengers are posed with the crossroad of either accepting an accountability system for their power or continuing their work at their own discretion. In the film, as a result of the Avengers' collateral damage, the UN mandates that the Avengers function only under the UN's oversight. The story unfolds with conservative Tony Stark holding the firm conviction that, as he puts it, We need to be put in check. Whatever form that takes, I'm game. While the hero Steve Rogers says, We may not be perfect, but the safest hands are still our own. It's not until Tony Stark sees the consequences of that check, depicted, of course, by the film in a negative light, through his friends being jailed for having done the right thing, that he finally concedes Steve's liberal point and goes over the head of his own supervisors to do what is right. And ultimately, Steve's liberal perspectives are vindicated by the day being saved, and the film has a very optimistic perspective on humanity's potential for autonomous good. Batman vs Superman, on the other hand, takes the conservative view that when humans try to live autonomously, they only make things worse because they are naturally evil. This is demonstrated in the film through the fact that the villain, Lex Luthor, is determined to prove one point. The devils don't come from hell beneath us, no. No, they come from the sky. He demonstrates his opinion through turning his father's painting of angels descending from the heavens to fight demons below upside down at the end of the film, such that the demons are coming from the heavens. Luther desperately wants to prove that external force is negative to humanity and that it cannot be trusted. This is why he is continually trying to villainize and corrupt Superman, the film's external force. But the film's director, Zack Snyder, is always careful to create negative results from Lex Luthor's actions. If it's not making the heroes turn against each other, it's creating a monster that is endangering good people or inviting a new monster from the heavens to create new danger just to make his point. As hard as Lex Luthor tries to upset the natural order of the world, by his own power he just makes things worse. 
One of my favorite depictions in the film of how good can only be brought about through an external force acting upon humans is shown during the U.S. Capitol scene. In the scene, we observe two men, Lex Luthor and Bruce Wayne. Although both men are resisting Superman and trying to be their own saviors in the film, we see in the scene a difference in the way the men treat their secretaries. Lex Luthor, fully intending to bomb the Capitol building, asks his secretary to go save him a seat inside, which is of course her doom. Bruce Wayne, on the other hand, is seen simply asking his secretary to call another person to his presence for him while he watches the proceedings on TV. The two secretaries, being respectively named Mercy and Grace, are symbolic of the fact that Lex Luthor would not receive mercy at the end of the film, and that Bruce Wayne would receive grace. So we see these external forces, mercy and grace, being denied by one person, who we leave rotting in prison at the end of the film, and maintained by another, who is redeemed and left strong at the film's end. Since the good brought about by Bruce Wayne at the end of the film is the result of grace, we can see that the film is very conservative, because grace and mercy are fully external forces. No one invokes them upon themselves. That's why in court, we never see a person invoke the plea of mercy. You stand accused today of murder. How do you plead? Um, I'm gonna plead mercy. Do you plead innocent or guilty? Mm, no, I plead grace, Your Honor. I will be the judge of that. So any good that Batman does by the end of the film is a result of grace being externally imputed to him. The film has a pessimistic view of humanity's ability to help itself. Now that we're all on the same page regarding the two series' political orientations, knowing that Marvel is liberal and DC is conservative, let's see what people's general political worldviews are and which films those views make them gravitate towards. Most people know that there are two groups of people politically in our population. There are liberals and there are conservatives. What less people remember or realize is that there is another huge group of people to be accounted for politically. This is the group of people who have no specific political worldview. These people are often referred to as swing voters in elections, or as I like to call them, ignorance. In political elections, this group of people in the middle are what accounts for political candidates often appearing to talk down to their audiences. When a political candidate is seeking a community's vote, they take for granted that the constituents in their voting pool who already agree with their personal political worldview will vote for them. This is because a conservative person would sooner vote for a bad conservative candidate than a good liberal one, in the same way that a liberal would sooner vote for a bad liberal than a good conservative candidate. Seldom does one hear a political candidate deliver lofty speeches about their politically conservative or liberal worldview. Rather, they spend their time delivering speeches toward those who have no political orientation in the form of promises. Because if a person does not care about political orientation, what they will care about and understand is what a candidate promises to give them if elected. Thus, because political candidates will by default attract those voters who share their political worldviews, winners of elections have traditionally been determined by politicians' ability to garner swing voters. Hollywood, however, has not adopted this practice. This is predominantly by necessity because a film can't promise to give its viewers anything. Even though people spend their box office dollars on films much in the same way that constituents spend their votes in elections. Because of this, films do spend their time artistically pontificating on the lofty philosophical worldview perspectives of their directors. The result of this necessitated practice is fascinating. Now remember, when people go to see a movie, the population of moviegoers is comprised of the same political demographics as in a political election. So when a liberal film comes out, liberals are naturally going to enjoy their liberal film. Similarly, when conservative films come out, conservatives will naturally enjoy their conservative film. But here's the question, where do the swing voters go? They predominantly gravitate toward the liberal film. But why? It's because when people go to the movies, they want to be entertained. Liberal films are generally better at doing that. As they offer up their philosophically optimistic message about humanity's abilities, we see the hero's vindication as he saves the day and the audience is being given a virtual pat on the back and leave with a yes we can attitude. This is easy entertainment for the politically indifferent crowd. 
Conservative films, on the other hand, offer a very different message. As they offer up their philosophically pessimistic message about the ineptitude of the human race, we see good people do bad things. Heroes die, and the politically indifferent crowd leaves with a bit of a natural downer. This is not naturally easy entertainment for the politically indifferent crowd. It's little surprise, then, that there is general favor at the box office for the liberally leaning Marvel films over the generally politically conservative DC Extended Universe. The last thing I want to address is those of you at home who are watching me and think I'm all wet. You're sitting there saying, Batman vs Superman didn't fall short of the box office because of its political orientation, but because it was poorly directed. You'll say that the choices made in the film's style were the problem. For instance, one of the most universal criticisms of Batman vs Superman was that compared to films like Marvel's, it was humorless. It's dark, humorless, oppressive moodiness was a turnoff for moviegoers. The problem with criticisms like this is that they have to account for an excellent case study that demonstrates otherwise. That example being not only dark and humorless in nature, but a dark, humorless film about Batman that was very successful. The film and its counterpart were so dark that they have been referred to as the Dark Knight series. Looking back at those films, I can't think of many lighthearted or funny moments, but the films were still roaring successes. So if both Batman vs Superman and the Dark Knight series were humorless and dark, what made the difference for the Dark Knight? It was a liberal film. Its director was Christopher Nolan, not Zack Snyder, and however dark the mood of the film may have been, the message of the films still held high hopes for humanity. So what does all this have to do with DC and Marvel overall? The fact is that DC has apparently locked itself into a fairly consistent line of conservative films. Zack Snyder is still overseeing the overall narrative, and David Ayer, think Fury, is directing Suicide Squad. And it doesn't take a genius to see from the Suicide Squad trailers that a film in which a group of bad guys is forced to do the right thing against their will, all told from a strongly pessimistic perspective, is going to be conservative. So what's my forecast? DC is going to hold its own. So long as it continues on its conservative course, it will never be as big as Marvel, but the conservative crowd is still going to provide enough of a consistent fan base to keep the series going. Should DC change its political course? Personally, I think not. We all know that whatever the studios think, some of our best loved films were bombs at the box office. And I think that Warner Brothers is making a positive contribution to the superhero film genre by adding variety to what would otherwise be an exclusively liberal Marvel run genre. Currently, there's something for everyone. Finally, I don't propose that by this theory I have unlocked the secret to forecasting every film's box office trajectory. There are any number of films I could list which stand as exceptions to my theory. While I was making this video, an article even came out which forecasted, based on pre-release tracking, that Suicide Squad would be a massive hit. The film could be a big exception to my theory. But I do think that by understanding this general principle, that we are closer to understanding box office trends, as well as the full importance of political worldviews in film. And with that said, I hope that you enjoy the upcoming superhero films in the next many, many, many years. And that as you watch them, you will remember to do so in such a way that you think critically. Think for yourself.